Hello, and welcome to our virtual farmer shop talk series. I'm your host, Amanda Gumbert, an extension specialist for water quality at the University of Kentucky. You are viewing the first of four conversations originally conducted in winter 2021. This virtual farmer shop talk series was an opportunity to have meaningful conversations with farmers and experts about practical ideas and programs that can help you weather hard times and have success with stewardship practices on your farm. We thank you for viewing this recording and hope that this interaction leaves you recharged and sparks new ideas that are applicable to your production system or to those whom you serve. The, this virtual farmer shop talk series was developed by a dedicated project team who work across the Mississippi and Atchafalaya River basins at different land grant universities. With funding from the EPA Gulf of Mexico Farmer to Farmer program, we have a long-term vision of improving farm sustainability and protecting soil and water resources. We also recognize the many challenges and sources of stress for producers. And while there are many risks and challenges on the farm, we know that there are producers who are methodically making calculated changes to their production systems in ways that are supporting their overall profitability and sustainability. While we had planned to be having these conversations as part of an on-farm field day, we are excited to offer these farmer-focused interactions in a virtual platform. We hope that you find these conversations as meaningful as we did and that you leave each session with at least one good idea. Today's speakers are Mr. Paul Dietman of Compere Financial, Mr. Steve Steerwalt, an Illinois farmer and representative of the Illinois STAR program, and Mr. Adam Chappell, an Arkansas farmer. Our first speaker in this portion of the program is Mr. Paul Dietman. Um, Paul is a senior lending specialist on the diversified markets team at Compere Financial. Um, Compere Financial is a member-owned rural lending cooperative and farm credit system institution that serves Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Uh, Paul and his colleagues um, provide loans and technical assistance to farmers who market their products through local food systems. And prior to working with Compere, um, Paul had some experience working with the state of Wisconsin and also as an ag agent in the University of Wisconsin Extension System. So um, Paul, you probably are well versed in lots of these challenges and discussions. Um, so we really look forward to hearing how you make conservation make sense. So all yours. Okay, well, thanks Amanda. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Um, as Amanda said, I'm Paul Dittman. I'm um, with Compure Financial, which is part of the farm credit system. And I co-lead our Emerging Markets Loan Program, which is a loan program for farmers who are marketing products directly to consumers or doing some sort of value-added processing. I work with a lot of, uh, a lot of farmers who are using practices like managed grazing, uh, a lot of organic farmers, um, a lot of people marketing meat direct to consumers and things like that. And um, I have a few dairies in my portfolio, not too many. Um, but, you know, as a lender, and I, I should also mention, I'm a landowner myself and, and implement uh, quite a few conservation practices on the land that I own. Um, and I'm today happy to answer any questions that you might have about the lending process or what lenders think about conservation practices and about financing conservation practices. But, um, you know, really as a lender, we, we look at three different things when we um, are considering a loan proposal. And number one is cash flow. You know, does the farm have sufficient cash flow to make the loan payments on the loan that's being proposed? Um, we look at the character of the of the person who's applying for the loan. And is it someone who um, has a propensity to pay loans back? Do they have a history of paying loans back and being able to service debt? Um, and then finally, we look at, at security and what's the collateral that's gonna support uh, the loan that we're making. Um, you know, as uh, as the world changes, we certainly are are more cognizant of the fact that, um, in addition to to what our typical financial risks are, we're looking more at climate risks. You know, in the way that that uh, changing climate is impacting ag production, and the impact on that production, of course, then impacts the cash flow of the farm operation. You know, we've typically mitigated risk with crop insurance, 
and crop insurance is great. It's, um, it's actually probably one of the best deals out there for, for row crop farmers, but crop insurance doesn't necessarily cover every practice that, um, that is being implemented on farms these days. And of course, as we have these catastrophic events where you know every two or three years we're having a hundred year flood event or we're having a drought, um, you know, as you tap your crop insurance, it starts to drag your yields down too and, and the coverage becomes less and less over time. So we have to be thinking more, as lenders, I think we have to, to think more creatively about mitigating climate risk through um, adoption of, of climate friendly practices, conservation practices. Um, there's some unique things about financing conservation practices though. Number one is that some of the practices uh, may have a short-term negative impact on cash flow. You know, if you're implementing a practice like um, like managed grazing, for instance, where the first year you've got money going out to build fence and to put in a watering system and lanes and things like that, and you're establishing pasture, you may not have any cash flow coming in off of that pasture in the in the first year, and maybe it's not a lot of cash flow coming in the second year. It might be the third year um, before it really becomes productive. And it's the same with organic transition to organic uh, production, you know, where you may have some negative cash flow in the first couple of years, and then eventually it, it, be, it turns positive. Well, as lenders, we have to um, figure things on an annual cash flow basis. And so if the short-term cash flow impact uh, is negative, is there enough other, other resources and other sources of income from other parts of the farm or from non-farm income to uh, make payments on loans while those, um, those new practices are being implemented. Uh, number two uh, issue that we run into is that some practices have a big capital expense tied to them, but um, don't necessarily add any value to the farm, you know, at least no value in terms of market value. So if you put in a big fencing project, it might cost $10,000 or $20,000 to put that fencing in. But when it comes time to appraise the farm, um, to refinance the mortgage or something, it's not really adding any, any value on the balance sheet. It so, certainly has value. I'm not suggesting that it doesn't have value, but it isn't value that turns up, uh, turns up on the balance sheet. And then third, uh, third issue that we run into fairly often is that more and more farmland is owned by non-farming landowners. You know, here in the Midwest, about 60% of farmland is, is now owned and controlled by non-farming landowners. And so that adds another bit of a uh, hurdle to the, the process of financing conservation practices because we either have to have that landowner be the one taking the loan to put in a practice if, if it's gonna require debt to put in a practice or the renting farmer has to be able to take on that loan without being able to use the land as collateral to support the loan. So that can be a bit of a challenge. Now I say they're challenges, they're not, uh, they're not insurmountable challenges I and mean, we can get past all of these things. There's ways of, of working around it. Um, public cost sharing is really important and public technical assistance is also really important. So being, being able to support those practices, reducing the amount of cash that the farmer has to put up and also the, the uh, lowering the amount of debt that a farmer needs to put up. You know, and in a lot of cases, we'll, if there's NRCS cost sharing on a practice, you know, and that cost sharing is 70%, um, we may set up a, a short-term loan, you know, like an operating loan for that 70% that's ultimately going to be covered by NRCS, and then maybe put the other 30% on an inter intermediate term loan. Um, once the money comes through from NRCS, we pay off the operating loan. And right now, operating loan interest rate is between three and three and a half percent. So a farmer may only have that operating loan in place for a month or two, you know, so the cost is, is really minimal to finance that portion that NRCS is ultimately going to come in and take out. Um, there are a couple of things. Uh, I know there's a lot of conservation professionals on, on the call today. And so just I wanted to make a couple of suggestions of what, um, what conservation uh, professionals can do to maybe support um, our side of things or, or help lenders uh, feel more comfortable lending into, into the conservation space. Um, number one is just our, we, outreach to lenders. You know, I think we always think in terms of outreach to farmers. You know, I was an extension agent for a number of years and, and uh, we worked with, with other professionals, but our main focus was on farmers. And I think a lot of conservation professionals, the main focus is on farmers as well. 
it amazes me how few of my colleagues know much about conservation practices and about cost sharing that's available to support those practices. You know, and, and by the nature of where I work, a lot of my colleagues are landowners and are farmers themselves. And even those folks a lot of times don't know that there's NRCS cost sharing or here in Wisconsin that you can call the Department of Natural Resources and have the county forester come out and walk your woods with you and give you all kinds of great advice. And there's practice, there's money available to implement practices in the woods too. Um, so just making sure that, that lenders are aware of those tools. And it helps us a lot because when we're putting a proposal together for a farmer, helping them work through a cash flow, if we can bring in those other NRCS or local county resources and plug those in, it, it can really, it can turn something from negative to positive in a hurry. Um, make sure uh, that, far, that uh, lenders are invited to field days and have them on your email lists and things like that so that they're always in the loop on things. Um, and I would also suggest maybe as conservation professionals, uh, maybe gaining a little bit better understanding of, of farm financing, you know, and how how lenders look at uh, at a loan proposal when it comes through the door. Not that you have to be an expert on it, but just kind of getting a, a better sense of what we look at and how we look at things. Um, I would say lenders are not, I think there's kind of a common misperception that lenders have a negative attitude about adoption of conservation practices or about financing anything that's outside of traditional corn, soybeans, uh, dairy or livestock. And I don't think that's necessarily true, but you know, we all have our comfort zones and, and yeah, certainly a lot of my colleagues are not comfortable with organics or with people marketing direct to consumers, but that's why our program exists, you know, so that if they have a, a farmer come in, it's a small scale farm and they're doing direct marketing, there's a place that they can send them within our organization where we can give them that kind of uh, support that they need. So. So Amanda, I think I'll stop there. And, and again, as we go along here, I'm more than happy to answer any questions about any part of the lending process. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, I'll just remind folks, if you have questions that you would like to direct to Paul um, or that have come up during his comments, go ahead and take this time to, to type those into the chat box. That way we have a record of your questions. And if we have some time, then we'll, get, we'll try to get those answered. Um, just a note, when we go to our breakout rooms the next time, um, Paul, Adam, and Steve will each go into a breakout room as well. So they will um, be there as um, possibly in your breakout room to answer the questions that you might have, have thought about too. So Paul, thank you so much for your comments and um, we're really glad to have you as part of our panel today. Um, um, our next speaker is Mr. Steve Steerwalt, and Steve is a full-time farmer from Sedoris, Illinois in Champaign County. Steve's the past president of the Association of Illinois Soil and Water Conservation Districts and has recently been elected to the executive board of the National Association of Conservation Districts. He also serves on the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Council, the Ag Water Quality Partnership Forum, and is co-founder of the Saving Tomorrow's Agriculture Resources or the STAR Initiative. And that's what Steve's going to talk to us about today. So Steve, if you're ready, if you um, have slides and you want to share your screen, um, go ahead and make sure you're unmuted. Thank you. Thanks. Well, uh, I, <clears throat> technically I can be challenged. I'm going to try sharing my screen, but if I fail, please run the slides for me. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. As, as I said, my name is Steve Steerwalt and I, I am a full-time farmer and uh, raising, raising corn and soybeans, but, but my interest lately has really uh, gone, to, gone to conservation. Um, the, the, the discussion topic today, as you all know, is making resource stewardship profitable for farmers. And, and you know, that is really the key profitability. Uh, that's the key. That's the holy grail to, to really get farmers going on conservation. 
How do we make how do we make uh, conservation profitable? In my area, I, I estimate that six to eight percent of the farmers are really doing any kind of enhanced conservation. Uh, they're, they're, we're, we're working on nitrates and keeping nit trying to keep nitrates and phosphorus out of, out of the water in our area. But it's, it's, it's really a struggle to, to get to that next group of farmers. That six to eight percent of the farmers are, are interested in conservation, they're willing to try things. Uh, the next group really needs a reason to, to, to move to conservation. And that's, that's what I'm hoping to talk about here today. So it, it is a struggle, but I think there is hope. Let's see if I can get to the next slide here. Okay, uh, the, the, it, the environmental landscape has, has really changed since I have, you know, for the 20 years or so that I've been involved with soil and water conservation, uh, generations growing up now really expect conservation. Uh, it's, it's not an option to them. They expect conservation and, and um, it's really caused governments and industry at all levels to, to try to respond. How, what it, how are they going to respond to this, what they could say is a new demand? So on the government side, with the with the new Biden administration coming in, especially, but even before that, there's the Growing Climate Solutions Act, paying farmers to grow cover crops. Uh, the as President uh, Biden has talked about that specifically, green banking, which is to do with carbon sequestration, <coughs> and even crop insurance that uh, discounts for conservation practices have been discussed. And then on the industry side, uh, industry is really trying to figure it out also. Uh, industry started talking about sustainability that kind of that kind of morphed to regenerate, regenerative. And right now carbon seems to be the, uh, the real interest. But um, I think what's, what's interesting for industry is that there's so much pressure going on industry right now from stockholders to um, uh, customers for industry to show that they are good uh, corporate citizens, that they are doing things to help conservation. And one of those that I thought was interesting and just, just I just saw was this net zero by 2050 or else. And that came from uh, Larry Fink, the CEO of the world's largest asset manager, BlackRock, uh, warning companies need to commit to net zero emissions by 2050 or have their stocks dumped. And so, this is a really a, a new player in, in the whole conservation area that, that, that there's actually pressure coming on industry and government to, to, to try to make things happen. So how do we as farmers respond? You know, there's sustainability, soil health, climate change, regenerative, carbon sequestration. All of these things take long-term practices. They, they aren't something that you're gonna see the benefit from right away, they, they're long-term. And as we as farmers know, to be long-term, they have to be profitable. Uh, that is one of our, as farmers, that is one of our um, uh, definitions of sustainability. You know, it has to be profitable. So how do we get to that? How do we get that? How do we get the farmer? How do we get the profit from these new conservation efforts to the farmers. So that is the question that, that our conservation districts in, in, in Illinois were, you know, were talking about uh, three years ago. How do we get that profit to the farmer? How can we get that next group of farmers, that, that middle adopters, as we call, to consider doing conservation? And, and you know, the, so, so we started looking at uh, ways to facilitate. How can we help facilitate and, and hopefully reward these farmers' efforts so they become long-term? So we came up with some uh, specific, um, you might say, points that needed to be part of this effort that we were kind of looking for. Uh, Bottom-up solution. Uh, most of the things we looked at were all top-down. And what we wanted was the opportunity for local people to be able to make local decisions on their local resource concerns. Because we think local people can really answer their, their questions best. 
Uh, easy to use. We want something that was easy to use. Most of the the uh, the plans that are out there are very very involved, very difficult, and not very user friendly. And we need something adaptable. We would need something to be able to work for row crops in Illinois, to to rangeland in the West, to raising raising uh, uh, cranberries in the East. We need something that's very adaptable. And most of all, as a farmer myself, we need something that makes sense to farmers. There, there's a lot of a lot of efforts going on out there that you know, uh, you know, we don't as farmers we think in terms of practices. What are the practices that? And if we are going to make a make, be able to help conservation, it's going to be by our practices. And so we don't think in terms of Haney tests. We don't think in terms of the 29 factors of soil health. We think of practices. So we needed, we thought we needed something that was going to be practice based. So, so uh, we looked around to try to find something that that fit those parameters and really weren't finding what we wanted. So uh, we decided to uh, try our hand at, at, at developing something ourselves. And so uh, that's what we call STAR, Saving Tomorrow's Agricultural, Agricultural Resources. And so uh, we start out with locally identified resource concern. What is, what is the resource concern if you're raising cotton? What is the resource concern if you're raising, uh, raising rice? It's different than, than mine, but there are, it's all, and, and so, and then it's based on practices. So what are the practices that help us get to answer those resource concerns? And that's where the evaluation comes in. Uh, STAR is, rel is, is unique as far as I know in actually attempting to set bench benchmarks for uh, we farmers conservation efforts. These, these the, we, we, look, we, ask our, we ask a science committee of, of those local resource, in that local area of those resource concern experts, okay, what are the practices that best lead us towards that resource concern? So if it's if you're raising rice and you're worried about the quality of the water or whatever the rice, I, I don't know. But what are the, the farmers and the and the and know what those resources, what what the practices are that lean, and then the science committee's job is to then uh, get those to, to where they go from one to five stars as far as that farmer's effort. Verification, very important to uh, both government and industry they, uh, to make sure that there's value to what we're, the, what people are doing. Recognition, I think, is long overdue for co farmers who are doing conservation and, and a, a free, free tool. <clears throat> so um, how is it working? And one of the, one of the <clears throat> surprising things to me and what very interesting things is that um, you know, as as a soil and water con as conservation districts, we've always pushed conservation. We've tried to get people to do conservation, and sometimes it's like pushing a rope. You know, there's nobody on the other end really pulling the other way. And so, what we found with industry and government setting their own uh, goals, it really changes the ball game. And in, in in instead of us just pushing it they have a goal that they are trying to meet for conservation. And so as long as they are really trying to do conservation, uh, what we're trying to do with STAR program is help facilitate getting to those goals. And so we have someone on the other end now pull, helping to pull that rope to get farmers to get into that long-term that we need for conservation. So one thing we learned uh, as we started to talk to the ADMs, to the to the uh, uh, the national and international companies, and even government, if if we wanted to really solve our resource concerns in Illinois, this this or something like it needs to be available nationwide, because the the national international companies, they don't want to do, deal with some one regional here and somebody else over there. They want something they can use to lay at least nationwide, if, if not internationally. So uh, and STAR is now in, uh, is being used to some form or another in six states. And we have another eight states that are in discussions from, from uh, Minnesota to Texas, to Massachusetts, to South Dakota, Nebraska. Um, 
there's different levels of interest right now in joining the, the STAR initiative. So just, just an example of a, of a pilot project that we're using as, as a way to get to show actually people making a change. That right now is the big thing. Can you show a change? And with the STAR with initiative, we, we've been able to show people uh, how it affects as they move from one STAR level to the other. So obviously we have a long ways to go. We don't have it all figured out by any means, but uh, uh, I, I'm very encouraged we're making progress. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate your presentation. Um, and there are a few, um, looks like a question or two in the chat uh, for you, Steve. So if you get a, a chance and you can um, type a response in the chat box, that'll be great. Um, we I, wanna... I'm, I'm not very good at multitasking, but I'll try. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are going to take the time now to go on and listen to our third speaker. Um, Adam Chapel farms 8,000 acres in Northeast Arkansas. He grows corn, cotton, rice, soybeans, and a mix of small grains. Um, he and his brother have re-envisioned ag management um, in their part of the world and have jumped into um, soil health practices, mostly to fend off herbicide resistant weeds and as he calls them, precariously thin profit margins. I think a lot of farmers can relate to that. Um, so um, I like Adam's quote that was recently in the Farm Journal article that says, call it soil health, conservation, sustainable, regen regenerative, or any other buzzword of the day. Frankly, I don't care. My savings have been incredible and I just call my farming what it is, survival and profitability. And I think those, those align with Steve comment, Steve's comments as well. So Adam, we'll let you take it away. All right, thanks, Amanda. <clears throat> yeah, so as you mentioned, we farm about 8,000 acres in cotton plant. And uh, I'm just gonna talk about one aspect of, uh, you know, what regenerative ag has done for our farm. Um, Cause the point of this shop talk today was, you know, profitability in tough times. And, you know, even with commodity prices moving up, I'm already seeing fer fertilizer prices moving up, diesel, uh, herbicide, seed, everything's following it up. Uh, so they're gonna maintain that same profit margin for the farmers, but so we gotta figure out how to combat that. So uh, my brother and I are fourth generation in cotton plant. We rent almost everything we've got. So, you know, if there's farmers out there that are watching this and say, well, it works for him because he, he owns it all. <laughs> I wish that was the case, but, uh, uh, We've been able to maintain competitive yields. You know, we started back in 2010 and, uh, you know, being in a renting environment, that's a competitive market. So we got to stay up there with the top producers in the area. Otherwise landowners are going to go somewhere else. So uh, the difference is we're making the same crops with about half the money or 60% of the money that it used to take. And uh, with the three year, four year stretch we just got out of, that's been huge. Uh, my brother and I are also members of the Arkansas Soil Health Alliance, which uh, our whole goal is to help farmers in the area try to figure out how to start using cover crops and implement soil health practices. So that's just a little brief background. Um, <clears throat> I, I grew up on a farm. That's all we've ever done, but I've had always had an interest in science. So when I left the farm, I didn't have any intentions of coming back. So I got a bachelor's in botany and then a master's in entomology and uh anyway the the lifestyle of the farm i guess the out being outside and working for myself just me and my brother couldn't stay away so we we came back and that's what we've been doing so one of the big changes we've been able to make that saved us a ton of money is fertility um farmers and, and this is just my opinion based on my experience of what i've seen but we have been over applying fertilizers forever and it's because we don't take into account biology and in, in how the soil functions it's we've been taught to treat soil as a petri dish if you add this and this you'll get this well that's not the case um you know so we're using in arkansas we're using malic three i don't know if that's common in other parts of the country i know it is down here but you know that's supposed to mimic what the plant will deem available in this growing season. Now, I have major problems with that in my system because it's made on assumptions that are uh, calibrated in a sterile soil environment. So, you know, maybe in a highly tilled 
dead soil, this is the best test there is. But on my farm, it, it means absolutely nothing. Um, so, uh, you know, and rarely is uh, fertility the most limiting factor. You know, this year, I know a lot of guys that fertilize for 200 plus bushel corn and rice and ended up with a lot less than that just because of our weather. So, you know, just like uh, Steve was talking about, we've got to factor in environmental risk uh, on an ever increasing uh, term. I mean, it's, it's, it's every year it seems like now. So, uh, you know, if it was as simple as adding like on this sheet here, 220 pounds of nitrogen to get 200 bushel corn, well, nobody would ever have any financial woes. We'd just make more corn. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> so what we've started doing and just as an example, this is some data from my buddy, Dan Prevost. Uh, Beth probably knows him very well, but uh, he uh, started me pulling uh, total digestions and comparing them to Malik threes. And um, I did a bunch of that this fall and the, the results are crazy. But, you know, when you look at the, the slide here, when you look at total digestion and see how much P and K and all that is out there, it's, it's hard for me to swallow an agronomist or somebody telling me I need to apply those products. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I would, I would think the better question would be instead of how much do I need to apply is how do we access what's already out there? Cause that's a tremendous amount. So, um, and the answer that we found is roots and biology. Um, you know, when you have more roots and biology, you're, pool that you're drawing for them gets bigger and more accessible. So um, we've uh, completely uh, eliminated P and K from our program in, in granular form. We put a little bit in our starter just as a, uh, you know, get the plant moving, but it's trace amounts compared to what our neighbors are putting out and what we used to put out. So um, we've eliminated that and hadn't seen any yield reduction. In, in fact, we've got data that shows that our yields have gone up when we reduce uh, synthetic fertilizer. So uh, as you can imagine, that's a huge savings. But how, how we've done that is root mass. Uh, you know, the center picture here is a, a soil pit we dug and we've got roots in abundance, you know, at uh, 40, 48 inches. Uh, we've found uh, living roots at 76 inches in this same pit. So. Uh, that's as far as we went with the track hoe. I don't know if they went any deeper or not, but so if, if you're going from a six inch soil test and just account for what's in six inches, but if you have active roots down to 48, just imagine how much more access to nutrients and things you have. Um, but not only do more roots give you access to more water and nutrients, they also give you more, uh, opportunity for colonization from mycorrhizal fungi and, you know, just increases the amount of biology in the soil that mineralize those nutrients. So roots, in my opinion, are the most important part of this whole soil health thing. So just to reinforce what I'm saying here, we, we did some uh, sampling at depth. We went to 18 inches is all we did, but we pulled zero to six, then right back in the same hole, six to 12, and then 12 to 18. And you can see, you know, in the three samples we have here, this is a Malik three extraction, which in my opinion is just a fraction of what's available to my plants. But if you just take that into account and add up the P and K in the 18 inch depth, then I've got 204 pounds of available P and 849 pounds of available K at 18 inches. And just a few slides previous, you saw roots at 48 inches. So, you know, this is again, a third of what we're actually accessing so fertility is not limiting on our farm it's it's we're, we're getting there without adding anything <clears throat> and it's all about roots and and the living creatures around the roots so just to show you what i mean uh, the picture on the left is hydroponically grown wheat uh, there are zero microbial interaction with that wheat and it's, it's medium that's grown in what water. So everything that is supplied to it is supplied by an input. So it's costing that grower exponentially more money to grow that wheat than it is the wheat on the far right, which has a very active rhizosphere. But 
I would say most of our soils that are heavily tilled and all that resemble the, the hydroponic more than, more than the uh, regenerative on the right. Uh, the one in the center is one that's been on my, it's on my farm that we've just recently uh, acquired, but it's about three years now. And you can see uh, the tops of the roots are starting to form a healthy rhizosphere, but I've still got a lot of, I've still got a lot of association left to go. So, you know, this is in development, but this, this is where we are on our long-term stuff. So this is, this is ultimately where we want to be. I mean, these seeds just germinated, just spiking, and they've got huge root systems already with an abundance of life around those soils. So this, this uh, weed on the right is going to require very little uh, input from a fertility sp perspective and probably uh, disease and everything else. We'll get into that uh, in a second. But um, when you have an active rhizosphere, you have mycorrhizal fungi present, bacteria, actinomycetes, all a, a huge number of things. This is just a, a small uh, mention of what's out there. But when you have active uh, mycorrhizal fungi, that's just like a, a huge expansion of your root system. And it's an expansion of your root system with things that can mineralize uh, nutrients from your soil in exchange for sugar from the roots. So they're doing all that work for free just from a little sunlight and carbon dioxide. So it's, uh, you know, we're missing out on a huge opportunity as farmers by not uh, fostering this, this uh, relationship here. Earthworms. So I, I, I gave a talk the other day in Arkansas and I asked the people that were watching, how, how many of them even thought about earthworms other than going fishing? You know, it's uh, when you leave your soil undisturbed and leave residue out there for them to feed on, you know, they're going to come. Uh, but there's data in the literature that says if you have a, a million earthworms per acre, they can digest 36 tons of soil a year. Well, the nutrient analysis from their castings, or poop for lack of a better term, is uh, generally on average of 4, 30, 73. And that depends on the uh, residues they're feeding on, but that's an average. So when you figure that, 4, 30, 73 in NPK, and then multiply that by 36 tons a year. That is a lot of free fertilizer. And they're doing that for you if you just leave residue on the soil for them to eat. So not only are they doing it for you for the residue, but they're saving you in diesel costs, tillage passes, a number of other things. So uh, we're, we run between 8 and 13 worms right now. So we hadn't quite made it to a, a 25 per cubic foot but hopefully we'll get there eventually. But even at eight to 13, you know, we're doing a lot of good there. The other thing about earthworms is, uh, in, especially in the mid South where we get huge torrential rains is the burrowing that they do can in, increase your infiltration rate 60 fold. So if you're at an inch per hour and you've got a million earthworms out there making holes, well, it's possible for you to absorb 60 inches of water an hour. Now, when you get five or six inches in 15 minutes, that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, which happens down here all the time, seems like anymore. Um, most of the deficiencies and diseases and things we see in the soil are caused by an absence of life, you know, an absence of competitiveness. So, you know, the pythiums, the root rots, the rhizoctonias, nematodes, all those things are opportunistic. And if there's not a competitor there for them, that's why we see those diseases. Lack of roots. And poor soil structures, why we see deficiencies in the soil, it's rarely because the soil is actually deficient in a nutrient, uh, at least in, in my experience. But nematodes is one that's big in Arkansas right now. Where there, there's all kinds of push for seed treatments and infer treatments for nematodes. And if people would just leave the soil alone and foster all the predatory nematodes and insects that feed on them, you know, tardigrades, uh, there's predatory fungi that feed on nematodes. If they would just leave it alone, there wouldn't be a need for expensive seed treatments or infer treatments to sterilize the soil. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense, but that's where we are. Instead of trying to fix the problem, we're trying to provide some kind of external solution with a chemical. And that's just a short-term fix that makes big ag money. It doesn't make us any money. So 
this is my last slide, but how do we build a healthy, active soil? Well, it's soil health principles. I mean, it's y'all have heard it a hundred times if you've seen any of these talks. Um, eliminate or greatly reduce um, tillage, uh, keep residue on the soil, plant deep rooting cover crops, and uh, you know we roll them down to create a mulch layer for things to live in, bugs, uh, you know, the earthworms feed on it, birds, you know, those things all feed on weed seed and, you know, they help the biology of the soil, but it's, it's, it's a whole different way of farming and we have a hard time getting people to adopt it because this scares people to death, but it's really simple once you get to going and the money you can save and, and the margin you can attain farming is, is a livable margin and doing it the old way or the, the way it's done now was not profitable for us at all. I mean, we were, we were going broke in a hurry. And uh, I know a lot of guys that still are, and these new commodity prices are, you know, they're a, a little beacon of hope, but again, the inputs are just following them straight up. So um, I doubt they're going to increase anybody's margin very much, but um, I kind of blew through that pretty fast, but maybe there'll be some questions in the chat, but that's all I've got, Amanda. Adam, thank you so much. Thank you for joining our virtual shop talk today. You can find more virtual shop talks on our website.